experiences where I've had like 5,000 post-it notes and people will text me saying hit record and then I still forget, so. So should we start with the intro song? Is that, <laughs> we do, do you have one you'd like to sing? <laughs> um, anything I sing my toddler, which is basically every song I know. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't have a choice. <laughs> Just not Baby Shark. That's the one song. Do you guys know that song? I remember hearing about it, but I don't have a young child, so no. I'm afraid of, in case you decide to blackmail me one day. <laughs> <It's being recorded. laughs> and it will never leave your head. It, just try not to, to listen to it ever. It will, will never leave your head. I will just imagine happy cute sharks and leave it at that. I am, oh, I need to change my picture. I forgot. I changed my picture for a work meeting and now my picture is me and a cat, which is not the picture I want popping up when I am not on screen here. You know, cats are the new Zoom celebrities though, so. And my cat is without a doubt adorable. Like anyone to say anything differently I will take outside and we can fight about it. <laughs> now, now, cancel, let me try that again. Okay. I am going to go on oh, mute. Rachel, if you'd like to go ahead and share your screen and have the intro slide ready to go. And then do you wanna just tell me when to start? Like, Sure, it would um, help if we had a couple of participants. But <laughs> <laughs> even if we don't, we're gonna go forward with the audience we have because I'm recording this to promote later. Um, but I would say let's give it as long as till five after for folks to sign in. Okay. Do you wanna maybe shoot people an email or maybe you've already done that? Probably. I'm gonna right. shoot an internal one here for sure. Don't, that's about to go out, no worries. Awesome. I can also have my partner join us if we want another, <laughs> if you want another person. Well, I mean, I think we've done enough of these just like record, like there, a lot of them go on our website and resources people listen to later. So I think it's, I mean, we just, I've done some that weren't supposed to have audiences. So I think it's, I mean, it's okay with me. I would just. I, I agree. The presence Definitely. of the audience isn't actually critical because anyone watching the recorded version doesn't know or really care who's there. So, uh, but I will shoot something out to the hub members.
Okay, I'm gonna say that greatness waits for no one and we should just move forward. <laughs> Sounds good. <clears throat> okay, well, I am Rachel Arudia and um, a OBGYN at the University of North Carolina and at the North Carolina Division of Public Health Women's Health Branch. And I am um, facilitating this conversation today with Anne Wormond um, on Innovation Thursdays, Thinking Outside the Box when Exploring Innovations in Maternal Health. So um, I think that we can probably skip this slide. Um, so the agenda today is first of all, to just cover um, some objectives and then um, to overview the MHLIC that's sponsoring this talk, introduce the speaker. And then at the end, we'll have some question and answer. So, um, so Anne today is going to describe the maternal health issue that, that is addressed by this innovation and describe at least one feature that makes this particular approach innovative in the scope of maternal health. Um, <clears throat> so Maternal Health Learning and Innovation Center is a HRSA funded um, center housed at the University of North Carolina in collaboration with multiple partners and um, under the, this grant that is um, goal is to support state maternal health innovation um, and implementation um, programs and so the mission of our center is to foster collaboration and learning among diverse stakeholders to accelerate evidence in, informed interventions that advance equitable maternal health outcomes through engagement, innovation, and policy. So our vision is to be an exceptional national resource center for eliminating maternal health inequities and improving the well-being for all families in the US. Um, we have been charged with building a nationally prominent resource center to house training materials online and to develop communities of practice and to expedite the translation of knowledge to the pra clinical practice through training and technical assistance and also capacity building. Um, so we work together with the state maternal health innovation programs and states that have been awarded those grants, as well as um, the Alliance for Innovation and Maternal Health, or AIM, and the Rural Maternity and Obstetrics Management Strategies Programs, or RMOMS. Um, we have three main areas of focus, innovation support, um, community engagement, and policy, and many of those areas of focus overlap with each other. So what we do is to build um, capacity and assistance with that. We also um, try to collaborate and connect people who are doing things with other people who are doing similar things. We um, provide national leadership in these um, topics and we try to find, share and develop needed resources. Our audience is really all practitioners of maternal health, public health and clinical who are trying to improve maternal health and maternal health equity. Um, and so we do training and resource dissemination and technical assistance for anybody, but we have more tailored and intensive um, resources for the state maternal health innovations and our moms program grantees. That include coaching events and peer support, peer learning opportunities. So here's a list of all of our partners, um, including the Georgia Health Policy Center, Race for Equity, Rose or Reaching Our Sisters Everywhere, AMCHIP, ACOG, um, and UNC. So the first and third Thursday of each month, um, we have begun hosting individuals and organizations who we feel are thinking outside the box and shaking things up to improve the health of pregnant people and mothers across the nation. So that is what we are doing today. And our invited speaker is Ann Wanland. She's a co-founder and CEO of Canopy. Um, and um, I think I will let you introduce yourself further, um, but she is gonna speak to us about Canopy and then when I'm gonna let screen share at this point. Great. Well, I'm so excited um, to be here today and to share um, what we're working on um, at Canopy with, with you. Um, and uh, I think I'll, I'll just go through the full presentation unless, you know, anything isn't clear and maybe, you know, you can ask questions and stop me um, if that makes sense. So Canopy is uh, a low cost evidence-based maternal mental health solution. Um, and it is um, basically today, I'm just going to talk to you about, um, provide an overview of Canopy. Hi, Alice and Abby, welcome. <laughs> uh, we just, just getting started. Um, talk a little bit about our design process, you know, how we came up with um, our program and the design um, of, of the app, actually show you the app. Um, talk a little bit about how we're thinking about equity and impact. Um, 
talk about our partnership goals, including our research questions, um, and then take questions and, and feedback, um, which I'm very much looking forward to. So Canopy's Mamas, the two co-founders are two Anne's actually. Um, my, my partner Anne um, used to work for the NHS, um, launched the first national mental health campaign there, um, as well as many kind of digital health products, um, you know, around breastfeeding, around um, parent education, uh, as well as mental health. Um, I have more of a background in global health. I've spent most of my career working um, in East Africa, either living there or traveling there for products, uh, projects um, and focused on maternal and child health, um, specifically nutrition uh, and behavior change interventions and primarily in operational and leadership roles. Um, Anne and I met at a incubator focused on research-based interventions um, that are prioritizing kind of cost-effective and um, scalable solutions to big neglected issues, which is how we landed here. Um, we, uh, so, so basically our, through our program, we were introduced to this um, kind, concept of guided self-help, um, specifically digital guided self-help, which um, are about teaching people therapeutic techniques. So giving people basically the tools and the space to practice ways to think about challenges that they're having um, using the same techniques uh, that clinical psychologists use or therapists use in a, in a session, um, in a face-to-face -face session. So there's a lot of evidence that um, guided self-help is really effective and can be as effective as face-to-face -face therapy. Um, if you're curious about the research, we've got um, <laughs> all of it. Um, and, and you know, in particular, uh, digital uh, guided self-help um, with a CBT kind of core structure is it's extremely um, evidence-based. And there are actually a lot of um, wonderful um, international RCTs that have been done. Uh, WHO has done a number of them, kind of using uh, CBT-based guided self-help. Um, they've done some experimentation with some digital methods as well, but basically the same idea where you kind of focus on explaining a technique and then um, giving the uh, person space to practice it. So we, um, so there are two uh, therapeutic techniques that are recommended by the US Preventive Services Task Force for um, preventing in particular postpartum depression. Those are cognitive behavioral therapy, therapy and interpersonal therapy. So CBT is a way to kind of give yourself a little space between um, a feeling that you're having and a thought that may have prompted it. Um, interpersonal therapy is a way of really strengthening your relationships. Many relationships are tested <laughs> um, in the perinatal period. Um, and uh, the, the one that, that doesn't get enough attention, but I think is really one of our, our core innovations is compassion-focused therapy, which is a way of using language and examples that shift feelings of shame and blame that are particularly relevant for um, new moms um, to other things. Evolution, society, biology, whatever it is, and um, you know, what, what I think really we, we realized um, over time, you know, going in our interviews, and I'll talk about our design process um, in a second, but, but that compassion focused therapy, we just, we had to have it as part of our program. Um, because, you know, if you, if you don't, if you're not careful with the language you use, um, there are ways you can actually increase kind of symptoms of depression and anxiety um, just by teaching techniques in, in a way that doesn't reflect those, um, that kind of compassionate language and, and thinking. So we started with a review of um, the academic literature. We had interviews with around two dozen um, researchers, clinical psychologists, pediatricians, and OBs, kind of talking to all the people who interface um, 
in a kind of a more research or practic practicing um, or interact uh, in a more research or practicing um, scenario with uh, new moms. We uh, pushed out a, a survey and had about a, a digital survey and had a hundred new moms um, complete it, kind of talking about, you know, what what challenges they faced, you know, what kinds of things do they wish they had known or, or wanted to have. Um, we did a landscape review of, of, of what products are already out there. Um, we did lots of in-depth interviews with moms who struggled with PPD, um, as well as those who struggled with PPD and used CBT. We did desk research on channels for engaging low-income moms in particular, um, a review of all digital mental health products 33 existing programs is where we ended up as kind of like the um, the really well designed um, strong evidence based uh, digital programs for women in the perinatal period, um, and then had four of our perinatal clinical psychologists um, review some of the content and the the approach that that we were creating. Um, Finally, we, we selected techniques and a program and an approach um, that we also had our, our, our advisory, our advisory board is all uh, basically all researchers um, kind of make sure that we were still on the right track <laughs> from this kind of filtering approach. Um, so what we came up with was a 10 day program of very short, simple and engaging audio sessions um, that can be either listened to or read in a mobile app. Um, with optional guidance to re improve retention. So that's the guided part of the, the guided self-help. Um, so we selected three programs that had were supported by multiple RCTs. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned before we use CBT, uh, interpersonal therapy and compassion focused therapy. I saw that Rose is part of the, um, the center. So um, really drawing from some of the evidence of that early research as well. Um, we, we used, in particular, we used examples that were, um, are relevant for moms that are really common challenges. Um, we were, I, I didn't include this in the design process, but we looked a lot at, you know, what are the key barriers that, that stop moms from seeking support? The kind of easy ones were affordability, time, stigma, and lack of childcare. There are plenty of other barriers, <laughs> um, that, you know, we're still, working through, but those were the ones that kind of um, came up in the literature. And then self-paced, it's asynchronous care so that a mom can access um, the program at any time of day, which um, the, the first mom who downloaded the app downloaded it in the middle of the night. Um, so we really wanted to make sure we, we could be a gap filler and you know make this available at, at any time of day. Um, so, so the app kind of looks like this. Um, I can quickly go through it. Um, it's just a very linear, simple, simple program. Um, and you know, some of the, the features, you know, we, we do it day by day, but of course moms can complete it as quickly. Um, I think we've only had a handful of moms actually do it as we <laughs> complete it as we expected, um, just day by day. Um, obviously the content is for expecting our new moms. And we also recorded stories from, from mothers to really normalize some of the, the challenges um, that um, come up again and again. So let me quickly, I'm gonna go through the app very, very quickly. You may have already seen this. I thought this would probably be easier than, um, than just going, doing the, the full demo so I can skip ahead. Um, so it's a very easy yeah, right sign up away. process. Um, a mom will select either new mom or expecting. This is uh, the EPDS as well as some other data that we collect to one screen moms to, to be you know directed to emergency support if they need that um, based on kind of indicating self-harm, but also to collect information on the common challenges they, uh, she might be struggling with so that we can direct specific content to her about that. Um, so it's just, she goes to her program. Um, it looks like this, the home screen is very, again, very simple. I'm sorry about the quality of this video. It doesn't look very good. I promise the app is not blurry. Um, 
So it's just, it's just these sessions here. So dealing with scary thoughts, 100% of new moms have intrusive thoughts. A lot of people don't talk about them. They can be incredibly scary. Um, my intrusive thought, uh, recurring intrusive thought was that I was crushing my baby under my pillow. Um, and I had that every night for a week. Um, but you know, the, these are things that, that can be quite scary and can be, be very jarring, but um, if you kind of understand what's happening, they can be easily managed. We talk about um, techniques for clearing uh, to managing worries, inner critic um, relationships. We talk about common challenges. And here we're not, you know, providing any kind of advice, you know, any that is, isn't, that falls outside of AAP guidance or, or you know, very kind of well evidenced guidance. What we're exploring here is kind of how these different challenges make you feel and how they affect your mood um, and, and ways to, to help manage that. So it's not, we're not providing any medical advice. Um, we're just providing very simple um, kind of techniques uh, and relating kind of the physical and emotional health to each other. So here we have uh, emergency help. Um, so that's in-app emergency resources that a mom can, can call. That's not very well developed um, right now. We just have some resources in there, um, but I can talk a little bit about how we're hoping to build that out for particular audiences later on. Um, we have ways of, um, so these are more of the stories I think that we discussed. Um, this is how moms can track their, their program. This is a, um, a day by day mood tracker. And then at the end of the program, we take the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale again and actually calculate the change in score. And um, so that we can actually say, hey, listen, this is, you know, this is how this worked or, or didn't work for you. Um, and that way moms can make some decisions about, you know, whether they want to seek additional care or support. Um, because obviously it's not just about our program, it's about creating impact. And then that, the app is also available in Spanish. Um, we're working on improving the, the kind of user experience so that you go to Spanish right away instead of having to select the language, because right now you'd have to know that Spanish was in the app to, to get there. Um, but that was really, really, really important um, for us to, to tackle. So let me go back to um, the slide deck here. So we've got two of, um, so we conducted a, a simple um, RCT using a uh, study platform, a common, like a Qualtrics study platform. Um, it's called Prolific. It's more commonly used in the UK um, as a way to uh, test the effectiveness of the program. So our, our two main research advisors on this are Dr. Kate Kavanaugh, who is just um, an incredibly prolific and influential uh, researcher of uh, digital CBT. Um, she wrote many of the meta-analyses actually that we um, used in our initial research and we just, um, yeah, she, she was just absolutely wonderful. And Dr. Alex Kelman, who actually um, was did a comparative research study on um, compassion-focused therapy and uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and he, his study design is actually what we used for this. Um, so we didn't mean to, to do an RCT at all. We started out as a simple pre-post. We just wanted to kind of see, okay, are we on the right track here? And the results were very, very good. And they were a little bit too good. So we thought, okay, well, this isn't really going to tell us anything that we're not getting right. <laughs> um, so let's add a control, let's make it bigger and add a control group. Um, we had four dropouts, um, but 100 participants across 18 countries. Our only requirements was that a mom was in the perinatal period um, and spoke English. Um, we asked for English fluency, but uh, I would say a lot of the moms probably weren't, um, based on the qualitative feedback we got, weren't that fluent in English. Um, and so, you know, to talk a little bit about our results, the reliable change index for the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale is 4.0. So if you see a change of above four, um, that's considered a reliable change or a clinical, I guess, change in, in your mood. Um, so that's what, what's been indexed for the EPDS. 
Um, so we had 65% of our participants have a change in score of above four. So the average was 4.8 um, and the treatment effect was 0.68, um, which puts us about on par with face-to-face -face CBT, um, which was really great and a little bit um, more effective than, well, more, more effective than other things out there like counseling, psychoeducation and support groups. Um, moms with initial scores of above 14 all scored below the referral threshold um, by the end of the program when we took that final survey, which was really exciting for us. Um, but then it was also very sad for us because we realized, especially through the qualitative feedback that in most cases, it's because the mom had gotten no other support. Um, and, and so this was just filling a massive gap. Um, then uh, there weren't any statistically significant differences across the groups, um, but younger moms did do slightly better, but not statistically significantly better. Um, we didn't see any significant changes in the control group. Um, and then I would say that the thing that wasn't so great about our study is, um, and, and I kind of pushed this to the back of my mind until uh, Rachel and I were talking yesterday, I'd forgotten this, but we'd actually taken anxiety scores too, GAD7, using the GAD7 and found that the program really, you know, didn't have a clinically significant change um, using that, that tool. If we had not been good with our statistics, it would have shown, I think that 73 participants had slightly improved scores, but you know, it, it, we, we have not cracked anxiety yet. Um, and I think, you know, we do have some other questions about that because anxiety is very, symptoms of anxiety are very, very common too for, for new moms. Um, so how we're thinking right now about equity and impact, uh, we, Anne and I have always kind of said to ourselves that just existing in healthcare is exacerbating the problem. Just being available was never gonna really work for us. Um, even if we, you know, tackled some of the barriers, uh, you know, affordability, thinking about time and childcare, asynchronous care. Um, we knew that the moms who are most likely to use the program were always going to be um, white moms, upper moms with more resources. Um, and so we didn't want that. Um, so we decided to become a social enterprise um, to, to kind of one, uh, you know, fight against that pressure to, to just develop an upmarket solution. There are a lot of meditation apps out there and, and apps that are kind of um, assume, you know, that you have a lot of room to go to a different room, you know, things that are, are really um, require resources uh, that not everybody has um, and have, you know, less of a strong evidence base. So we really, we wanted to stay away from that. So we decided, can we, you know, we can align both revenue and impact, make something more cost effective and effective um, and not do a subscription model um, because those incentivize you actually to be less effective. So moms can always access the app once they're in. Um, it, you know, you, once you're in, you've got it forever. Um, but we wanted to have a discrete program because we, we know that those are more effective. Um, so yeah, so basically access does not, just mean being more available. Um, we are absolutely failing Black and Latina moms the most in this space and, and across all maternal health, as you all know. Um, so we were asking ourselves, well, what other complementary services are at-risk moms receiving? So what, what are ways that we can make sure that Canopy is a complement um, or can really be you know, given to moms in a really supportive way um, and not just kind of made available. Um, so we have been talking with many, actually in North Carolina, um, several home visiting programs, um, talking to a, a collection of a home visiting programs, actually in the Durham area <laughs> um, in October. Um, and we've been talking to lots of social support organizations, Healthy Families America, Zero to Three Healthy Steps, um, you know, about how uh, the app can be used as part of existing um, work, social support work that's happening with new families. Um, we've got uh, a few conversations with um, FQHCs 
and um, par a partnership, a new partnership with Washington DC, um, which is really focused on prioritizing black moms um, in particular. And um, they are going to help us get feedback and extend our reach. So, you know, we've been thinking a lot about, you know, digital, digital programs in particular and how we can make them, you know, really get to the final destination <laughs> um, in the most effective and, and supportive way. Um, so the way we're, we're thinking about partnerships right now, and this is um, our, our revenue stream too, is um, providers. So, you know, our goal is really that you're just, the app is available before a mom needs it. Um, because often afterwards, after is just, is, is late for a number of reasons. Um, and so we can customize it for, for practices, including EHR integration with the, the scores that we're capturing with the EPDS. Um, we're also partnering, obviously, with a city, um, but also looking at departments of health and, and payers as more of a population health approach, um, reducing direct and indirect costs. 90% of um, cost healthcare expenditures are borne by depressed women, um, de depressed moms in the first year. Um, so there is, you know, a, a movement in the maternal health space to do more value-based care and more risk-based contracts um, and, and customize with specific providers and resources that are more appropriate for, you know, the group that is um, part of that um, either, you know, payers population or the, the city's population, et cetera. So with the Washington DC, they've got a number of maternal health resources um, that we can make available to the moms there. And that just kind of helps us close the loop um, in terms of, of resources that are available. So some of our, our research questions, and we are looking for research partners, are um, how we can be better at predicting who the app is going to work for and why that was a big, flaw in our, uh, well, I wouldn't say flaw because we didn't, we didn't really know, you know, enough when we were um, thinking about our first RCT about what we really needed to answer. We just, we kind of just wanted to know, okay, is this, is this effective? Like, can we, is there a reason to go forward with this? And there was, which was very exciting. Um, but now we have a lot of questions. So who, who is the app going to work for and why getting really better at predicting that, um, evaluating wh whether there are any preventive benefits. Um, so recruiting more pregnant women, the vast majority of the, the moms who use the program right now are new moms. Um, usually they have um, babies under a year old. Um, most fall in the six month to 12 month period. Um, but we're, we're not seeing a lot of um, expecting women coming through the app. And that's partly because the, our, our partners so far have mostly been pediatricians and um, with the support of the American Academy of Pediatrics linking us to, to some of them. Um, and then understand better the relationship between perinatal anxiety and depression. I think one of our, you know, it's hard, we have a lot more to explore here, but we had um, two moms in our, our treatment group have dramatic, you know, over 10 point reductions in their EPDS scores. Um, and we saw in both cases, their anxiety scores shoot up. So it made us wonder you know, the way, you know, our research advice, one of our research advisors described it as sometimes when someone's coming out of a, a major depressive episode, their anxiety levels can go up because they're, they're confronting um, more directly thoughts and feelings that they had been, you know, suppressing. Um, and so now we have to understand better, well, how can we, you know, shift, how, how can we create more support for those moms so that they don't, you know, fall back into a depression after, you know, being an onslaught of, of all those, those feelings. Um, and, you know, there are absolutely referral pathways that we can explore for that as well. It doesn't have to necessarily be in the app. And then understand the differences in um, having the program as part of a home visiting program versus just as a resource. So really, you know, what, what are the, the real benefits of that? Do we see better retention? Do we not see any difference? You know, what, what's really getting um, more granular in that? Because we really 
do think that there's a very exciting um, use for a tool like this as part of home visits. Um, it's a way, you know, to spark certain conversations, to follow up on certain issues for the, the home visitor. Um, and, you know, home visiting programs, I think, are, are going to keep uh, increasing. So that that is the um, presentation that that's the app. Um, I'd love to to hear. Um, I'll stop sharing there. Uh, I love to hear your questions and, and thoughts um, and feedback. Of course, we are, we're always looking for, for all of that. Um, and thank you for listening. I'm not, I di didn't track my time, so I'm not sure how long I went there, but. <laughs> okay, we have, we have lots of time for questions and we already have um, some questions. Thank you so much for that presentation and thanks for your work on developing this and trying to meet this need that, um, that we know women have. So um, any, we're a small group, so I'm sure anybody who, um, can, who wants to, you know, unmute and ask questions, but I'll try to go through some of the ones I have. So um, can you, just a couple little details about the app. Um, is it available anywhere? Like how can people access it now? What's the cost and when did it officially launch? So um, the, the app is uh, free as long as a mom agrees to provide feedback and we don't actually follow up on that. Um, that it was a way to make sure that um, any mom could, in a not, in a in a way that wouldn't make her feel at all bad, access the app, and that's that's the nobody should feel bad for not having access to care, or, you know, a, a resource that is affordable. So we so the app is always going to be free for low income moms and always free for moms through that path. So um, we actually most moms do choose that I'll provide feedback, which is also great for us because we are very new. So the feedback is more valuable than anything to us uh, right now. So a mom can just download it from the app store. We, we had a, a very basic version of the app and we have a slightly less basic version um, of it out now as of a few weeks ago, I think two weeks, no, about a week. We've had it out for about a week. Um, and um, so, the, the most common referral pathways right now are um, pediatricians that we've been working with will refer moms to the app um, around the time they're conducting a screening. Um, but it really, but we also have licensed clinical social workers who are using the app um, at you know maternity clinics um, and then and and moms not really in the U.S. because it's very our findability in the US is pretty low right now, but in other countries. So we have, you know, moms from India, Nigeria, Canada, France, Germany, like all, all moms from across the world who are using the app right now on the app store. Um, they're using the previous version and, and um, hopefully can still find this new version. Sorry, so, and then it's, so it's available at, at, in the Apple store and in the Google Play store. Like, so, right. yeah. Okay, okay. Yes. great. Um, so someone says, I love your consideration of the needs of Black and Latina moms. What efforts have you made to market or raise awareness to these groups? And additionally, what did you do to make the app culturally appropriate for them? Yeah, um, so that's been really, so I, I should also say we're, we're pretty new. We started less than a year ago. So a lot of things um, we would love to work on haven't worked on quite yet because of um, just two people working on the app, um, me and my co-founder um, so far, and um, it's a time and resources. But that was a big goal of our, our partnership with um, Mayor Muriel Bowser, because uh, they have really focused most of their maternal health efforts on um, wards, which are just like areas, neighborhoods in Washington, DC that are predominantly Black. Um, so there are a few centers that will be hopefully partnering with pretty soon um, to start to get kind of feedback and, and make sure that the, the app is actually um, reflecting the experiences, the, um, you know, feels culturally and um, feels like a wonderful experience for, for black moms as well as um, white moms, um, because that is something that, that obviously we're, we're really concerned about. Um, we haven't seen in the app, we do collect data on ethnicity and race, um, and we haven't seen any difference in engagement um, 
you know, but we have a small ish sample size. It's just 650, say 30% of the moms have been black. Um, and, uh, but, but no difference so far in engagement. So when we look at our analytics, like on the back end, um, we haven't seen any difference yet. What we tried to do is um, make sure that we were using examples that weren't just, you know, relevant to one group or another. So we do talk about, you know, poverty is a huge risk factor. So we, we talk about not being able to afford you know, certain things we don't assume that everybody has a partner we certainly don't assume everybody is you know has a heterosexual relationship um if they do have a partner um so we've been very um conscious of that um but i think we can do better in that that's been a big kind of hope for this partnership with the the mayor and and focusing on dc in particular um so, so yeah, so we are definitely in feedback mode still. And I don't, I can't imagine ever leaving that because we'll always learn more stuff and we'll always be able to become more relevant and inclusive um, to different audiences. Um, so yeah, that, uh, but I would say kind of finally on that, you know, that was also a reason why we decided to do the, the trial internationally. Um, and we had moms from, three African countries um, participate, um, you know, one actually Mexico is the only country in Latin America and the rest were um, Europe and Asia. Yeah, so a few countries in Asia and mostly Europe and then the US. Um, so we, we definitely wanted to make sure that across cultures, um, if we were able to, to spot any differences in engagement or, or dropouts that, that we, were, we could do that with the app. So great. Um, and I think you just answered one of the questions, which is where the user, the 650 users are located. Um, I was wondering um, if you could talk about how many of those are using it in Spanish. So far, I have to say it's been a tiny number. I think I would say under five, and I think it's because of the 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 way you find the language is not intuitive, um, and it's possible that we just um, so this is just uh, the burden is on us to make sure that moms who speak Spanish actually know about this resource and and are using it. Um, so that that is a challenge right now. And then, what um, are do you have plans to expand to other languages at the moment, or? We would love to. I mean, right now it's just kind of a resource question, um, but but we would really like to. And it could be that that's an area where technology can help us. Um, but it's it's really it's hard because audio was a very conscious choice for us. We didn't want literacy um, to be a barrier, and we we wanted to make sure um, you know we had kind of both options: reading, reading, and um, a, a written program as well as an audio-based program. Um, so it is harder to translate audio into other languages. And, and we're not sure because we tested through our, our you know, small research trial, the audio um, component, we're not as sure if the, the written component would be as effective. So it, yeah, we're, it's, it's something that we, are, it's a challenge for us. We no no plans yet. Spanish Spanish and English for now, but it's definitely a future hope, a goal to to do more translation. And have you been surprised by any of the feedback you've received from the users thus far? Um, I I do all the recordings, and I hate my speaking voice. And we we got a lot of qualitative feedback from our research trial, and people it matter like the having a soothing tone of voice really matters to people that um, which makes intuitive sense, but I never thought my voice was soothing. That is good feedback we get. Um, no, but I think I think what has felt really validating and great is um, we focused a lot on making the concepts not just relevant to this audience, but really simple, like use very simple examples because the problem, like CBT can be very academic um, and it feels like a chore. So we didn't want our program to feel like hard work. 
Um, and we knew that was a, a from talking to researchers, that was a criticism of some other programs that um, have been tested. No, criti they've criticized their own programs for, for that reason. So we wanted to make it feel like a great experience. And, um, you know, we, we have our clinical results. I guess I could say that, you know, 100% of the moms who were in the treatment group reported that they felt better after the program. I think 50% said a lot um, better and 50% said a little um, better, which was great. We, we felt, I, I think that kind of um, perceived value of the program, having that, that feedback was really, really exciting. Um, and um, I think what else has been surprising? You know, the things that haven't been surprising is that apps are hard to get right and that you know, what people, the features people want and stuff like that, which we're, you know, constantly trying to get right and improve. Um, but, you know, nobody likes an app that doesn't work perfectly. <laughs> so we've been just move, trying to get it, um, you know, faster and the performance better and, and stuff like that. Um, I think also, you know, the severe, the, I, my like greatest hope um, was that it would work really well for moderate to mild depression, but to, to have our results um, with a kind of more group that was experiencing more severe symptoms was just really, really awesome. It just felt wonderful. Um, yeah. So a couple of questions about the process. So um, one is, um, appreciate how thoughtful you and the other and appeared to be when designing this, you went through a lot of research and thinking through goals. What advice do you have for others innovating in this space when they are in that important design process, but maybe getting anxious to launch or grow their program or products? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a really hard one. Um, I think, you know, having a really clear, because our, our entire, we had kind of our lens was just effectiveness and cost effectiveness. It was just those two things. And it, so it really required a certain process to get there. Like we, there wasn't gonna be a way we could kind of shortcut anything. Um, and I would say, you know, there is this pressure to kind of come up with something new or, or to think of innovation as um, the kind of the content and, um, you know, just the newness of something. And I think there's just so much great stuff already out there. It's just a matter of trying to make it, you know, work a little bit better, a little bit differently, you know, for whatever goal you're trying to achieve. Um, so I would say kind of go with something simple that works and then build, build on that. Um, if there's like a pressure to launch quickly um, and also just have very, very clear goals about what you specifically are using as your framework for design. So if, if it's if it's research, if it's um, a particular type of technology, you know, whatever it is to just be kind of laser focused on that. Do you have any advice for other maternal health advocates who might be innovating and wanting to design or work with new technology, but aren't experts in the technology? Like, for example, someone who has an idea for an app, but no experience with app design? Oh, it's totally possible. <laughs> <laughs> there are app builders out there that are really great. Um, you do not have to know how to code to create an app now. Um, and there are things that you can do to make your app HIPAA compliant. And um, so what we use are integrations with companies that specifically store, store um, private health information. And then just simple, simple, there, there are so many platforms out there that you can use um, to create, you know, your own algorithms, your own logic, you know, whatever, whatever you want to do. Um, this is definitely the time if you are ever going to launch an app to launch an app, you do not need to code. I'm very happy to, you know, talk to anybody about that. <laughs> was, yeah, don't need a software engineer on your team. <laughs> um, okay, so then a couple other, so um, have you explored working with WIC programs? That is, that would be really, really wonderful. We spoke with one researcher who um, recommended that last year. Um, and honestly, it's just that we we're, we are so recent that we've been able to start having more large scale partnerships. Um, but WIC, I think would be a really, really good um, partner for us, what we wanna do, yeah. 
Have you, so a couple of research questions. So have you um, either followed any of the women who were enrolled initially to see if the effects were lasting? And then also have you asked if any of them are planning to use it in future pregnancies? We actually, we have been, so we did um, a four, a one month follow-up and then decided at that point, um, given kind of resource and time constraints that we wanted to do kind of a fuller study anyway. Um, but I think it's a good idea. You know, I think we're about three months out now, which was when we thought we would do another follow-up if we were going to. Um, so it is actually something we can and, and, and will do. We did not see um, from our two week to, to four weeks past that, so I guess six week follow up, we didn't see any difference in um, the, like it was, we were still at 65%, but what was the, I would say the one thing that we st started to see chip away was some moms had a, a greater improvement and some moms had a less of an improvement. So it sort of netted out at the same change, um, rate of change, but there was more variability, which made us um, think a little bit more about the resilience, like what, what other kind of like small kind of reminders or nudges we can give to moms who graduated from the program to try to keep some of that effect, um, that, that kind of protective, you know, um, protective layer of the program intact. Great, and then um, it sounds like a lot of the pilot was done with international participants. Is there any research to indicate that the maternal health, mental health needs are different in, um, or universal between countries and ethnicities or do they vary? Uh, I, don't, I don't know that I have good, I definitely don't have good scientific um, evidence of that, but I will say that, you know, I worked for years in a uh, community in Rwanda with new moms um, whose children were malnourished. And, um, we, you know, when I was pregnant and as a new mom, I went back to those same materials, those same things. And we had, you know, obviously those materials were created by community members. We wasn't like, you know, the, those were the, those, the issues that we face as <laughs> new moms are, are pretty universal. The things that we worry about, the things that we, we care about and the struggles. Um, so it felt to us like there was enough, at least that was core and overlapping across cultures um, that we could build on. Um, and, and CBT, you know, because it's just been the thing that keeps being tested, <laughs> um, you know, it, it has a, a really strong international evidence base. And I mean, it's really interesting the way that you guys are collecting data and asking your, your participants to provide that. I'm guessing that there's no selling of their data or um, sharing it with third parties. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, but, um, but anyway, that kind of gives you an opportunity to, I would guess, to tailor. So like in the future, it sounds like you could look at the impact in different cultures or ethnicities, and you could even try, like you could even potentially individualize the, the treatment, like say, if you found that Nigerian moms need, I don't know, a, a different type of CBT, like you could modify it and kind of test that as you go. Um, it seems like that's the way the app's built. So that's a really cool idea. Um, I have a question. How did you come up with the name Canopy? Oh, I wish it were a better answer. It's just kind of like we wanted to evoke <laughs> protective kind of um, something kind of nature-based and connected. Um, and it was just kind of like free word association. Um, and, you know, with all of our design, we, we wanted it to be friendly and approachable, but not overly feminine or pink or anything, you know, we wanted it to be kind of um, just sort of nice, not, um, not like a lot of kind of branding for, for women, <laughs> it's you know, very pink. Um, so we, we wanted to, to kind of just evoke a feeling um, with our, our name and our, uh, our images and stuff like that. Great, and then um, I think this might be the last question I have so far. Um, ha reflecting on how access to the internet can be a barrier for some, um, do, you, do you think this app could be used in small groups or in person? And, and secondly, I'll add to that, um, 
Can you just clarify, like if someone's downloaded the app, do they have to have internet access to keep using it or can it still, can they still go through the program once they've downloaded it? Yeah, this is our, this is our big struggle because so we did, we, we did want a mobile app because that is the most universal thing that people have. Um, but it is not the universal thing. Um, and especially access to broadband is, is an issue. So the way the app is currently structured, you do need um, some data to stream parts of it. Um, anything that's connected to the server has to be streamed, um, which is part of the, we, we don't have any videos on the app. We deliver those. If somebody gives us a, their email, we, do, we have videos that we do there because we think more people are going to be accessing um, email if they're accessing it in different places. Um, that said, the next generation of the app is going to be a one-time download. Um, so you could download it anywhere um, so that streaming isn't an issue. Um, and then have you heard of anybody using it in groups? Like for example, a peer group gets together and goes through the app together and has that, have you thought of that or has, is that happening? I think that would be really wonderful. Um, we're, we're thinking, about, I mean, not just the, the home visiting program, but there are, you know, support groups that could potentially, if you're collecting people around an issue or trying to address an issue um, together, it, it can be nice to focus on the same thing and use it as a way to kind of learn techniques together and encourage each other. Um, and I would say that we're also thinking about how we can build a really intentional supportive community online. We, we struggle a little bit with this because social media actually makes us feel worse and moms um, in particular have a way of feeling bad <laughs> when they're interacting with other moms um, because not intentionally it's something everybody does and it's because we compare and there are biological reasons we compare ourselves to, to other people um, it used to be very important for our survival to understand where we were in the social hierarchy that's not the case anymore it's just it's not helpful to do it but we all do it um so we we before we create like a real community online we need to figure out how to do it in such a way that you know everybody participating is able to kind of um understand certain ways of engaging and, and what you know can be helpful and what can can potentially cause harm when it comes to sharing advice and sharing information Okay, sorry, there's one more late breaking question. Have you uh, considered having the voiceover part re-recorded even if still in English by a native speaker in the countries where it's most popular, such as a Nigerian person read it for the app available in Nigeria? Yeah, that's, that's an, we could actually reach out to, to our Nigerian moms and ask them if they would be um, willing to do that. Cause there, there are different creative ways that, that we could do that. That would be, that would be pretty awesome. Um, we are, um, you know, it's been a little bit kind of hectic now, but um, we are talking to a, a partner that does vaccine reminders in rural India, um, and they have about a million parents on their platform. They engage with them on WhatsApp, and so we're thinking also about different ways to deliver the content in um, in areas or among populations that might be using WhatsApp or text message, um, and and we would have the capacity to translate it um, and and how you can kind of uh, make use of not just those other languages, but you know, those other ways of, of getting content out. But that's a, that is a really good, you know, maybe we'll reach out to our, that's a good question, Nigerian moms, and ask if they'll record it. <laughs> well, thank you so much um, for talking to us. I think um, that was really, it was really interesting and thought provoking. And I think it will be a really great um, resource for people to know about and also, um, to learn from the process that you all went through. Um, so thank you. And um, I think we can we can end now. Oh, and oh, anybody who attended, if you would please fill out the evaluation that is in the chat, that would be great. Thank you so much, everyone. And please do, I'll just put my email in here if anybody has any other questions or would like to, to chat or has any other feedback. Um, as I mentioned, we are definitely in feedback mode, so. <laughs> And that was fantastic. Thank you so much. I want to let you know that my colleagues and I have been chatting back and forth about, wow, this is really interesting. She's doing great work. So as you were presenting, we were talking about you. Oh, that's very nice. 
it's it's hard on Zoom because you don't really know how you're doing. <laughs> so I really no, and nobody really wants their faces up here, and so we're all just sitting <laughs> here with our cameras off. But you did a great yeah. job. This app is really fascinating and really cool. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. We have a long way to go, um, but and we are looking for for partners and and more feedback. So I really appreciate it so much. We appreciate you and we'll, I'm hoping we'll be in touch and you know, as this app grows, MHLIC would love to touch base with you again. So Great. thanks a lot. Wonderful. All right. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.